Welcome to the 2015 CNP All Hands Call. As usual, we're broadcasting live from the Defense Media Activity Studios. I'm Petty Officer Andrew Johnson, and joining me today is Chief of Naval Personnel Vice Admiral Bill Moran and Fleet Master Chief April Beldo. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you. Well, thanks for having us. Well, we know both of you have a habit of going around the fleet and doing these all hands calls. Is there anything that you've heard, any feedback you'd like to share to start the show off? Well, I think, uh, Pettus Johnson, we would love to just write the, get right to questions. Uh, we know that there's ships out there in uh, the 5th Fleet AOR that are dialed in. Uh, we know that there are folks from fleet concentration areas on both coasts dialed in. And we only have an hour, so I think what we'd prefer to do is just get to their questions. Yes, sir. Let's get okay. right to it. And for our let's first go. one, let's head over to social media with MC1 Jen Blake. MC1, what do you have for us? Thanks, MC1. Our first question today is from NC1 Wetzer on USS America. And he says, over the last few years, there have been several force shaping tools rolled out, such as ERB, EETP, and PTS, which is now Seaway. Are there any plans for any future initiatives for manning control? CMP, I'd like to take this one sure. on. Thank okay. you. All right. Well, NC1, thank you so much for the question. And with regards to, are there going to be any more changes um, or initiatives for force shaping? I will um, share with you absolutely not. Seaways came online and it provided us an opportunity to make sure that we were um, paying attention to the health of all of our ratings. So um, with regards to any force shaping, absolutely not. CNO's committed to that. He said no more ERBs, so you don't have to worry about that, shipmate. So we, we also, uh, in addition to not doing ERBs, which is an involuntary way to ask people to leave the Navy, but there are some measures we're putting in place to make it easier for people to understand what their opportunities are in the Navy. So billet-based detailing, which is a program that's coming out uh, this summer, is, uh, is, is going to be an additive measure to what we already do in CMSID, so you have a better insight into what's available for you when your orders come up. Uh, that's after you've been through the Seaway process of making sure you can re-enlist. So there are some things coming out, but there's nothing coming out that would, uh, that would indicate that we're going to ask you to leave before you're ready to leave. That Thanks make for the question. Some, that should make for some happy sailors right there. Yeah. All right, for our first question, let's head out to USS Carl Vincent. That is already underway. Carl Vincent, go ahead with your question. Sir, Mass Chief, NT1 colleagues, HSM 73, deployed on the USS Carl Vincent. So yeah, we're well, if you see the tradition, in this, this uh, CM and the enemy. So if you say, yeah, uh, do you do the tradition, you can say, sir. Good morning, sir. Question for you. Hey, hey shipmate, I'm sorry. We, we lost you and I got a little interference. Maybe you could repeat the, the basis of your question, please. So, that one just say, uh, Master Chief. Master Chief. You're Master Chief, I have a question. In support Stand of Operation up. Inherent Resolve and engaging the enemy, is there any plan on us receiving imminent danger pay? Uh, got it. Hey, thanks for the question. We, we got that uh, back in August when we were out there on uh, the ship Bush. you relieved on the Bush. Mm -hmm. And uh, the answer is the, the imminent danger pay areas are defined by the, co the combatant commanders. Uh, so we live under their rule set. And right now there is no, there is no plan to reinstitute imminent danger pay out in Fifth Fleet. That said, we're not doing anything with ca uh, combat tax exclusion zones. And we're continuing to uh, look at ways to make sure that we incentivize you out there at sea. That's why you saw a pretty significant bump in career sea pay this year. Uh, CPA premium, and also uh, long deployment allowances that uh, were instituted with Bush and Batan. So hang in there. Uh, there is not going to be, to my knowledge, any change in imminent danger pay in the near future. Definitely a popular question. For our next one, let's head out to Everett Washington via Skype. Everett, go ahead with your question. Good morning, sir. My name is OS2 Hala from Naval Station Everett. And my question is, what are your views on transgenders in the Navy, and where do you see the Navy on the subject in the next couple of years? Yeah, I'll tell you that uh, we, we are starting to talk to OSD, uh, Office of Secretary of Defense, and the uh, folks in policy that uh, reviewed all of those policies related to Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which we went through for several years and finally got to a place where all of us were comfortable. Uh, transgender is another issue that we'll have to take a look at as is that uh, as men and women who join the service or once they get in the service decide uh, that they want, to, they want their personal interests addressed. So we are looking at that today. Uh, we have not set any policies that are, uh, that are counter to anything that you've read about here in the, in the last few months. So uh, I appreciate the question. We'll continue to look at it. Uh, and I think most of us feel that what it is all about for us as sailors is the dignity and respect we show for each other, no matter what our backgrounds are. Thank you for that, sir. For our next question, let's go live to Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk, go ahead with your question. 
Good afternoon, sir, Master Chief. This is Petty Officer McBride. Do you two foresee any changes to the current physical readiness test in regards to how it's conducted? Well, thank you, sir. You Shipmate, thank you so much for the question. And as um, we have traveled throughout the um, area, we continue to get that same question. And uh, we are taking a look at the way that we um, um, perform our PFT, but most importantly, we're concerned about the health of all of our sailors. So we've asked for feedback from the fleet. If you have something that um, you feel that would um, help us better um, our culture of health, please do not hesitate to send me an email. Um, everybody has my email. You can find it on Facebook. So just shoot us a card and let us know um, what you feel um, would help us all in um, um, gaining a culture of fitness. So this, this is one of those topics where we have uh, 325,000 sailors in the Navy and 325,000 opinions on the PRT program. So uh, it, it, every stop we go, every all hands call, this issue comes up. Uh, and so we are addressing it. We've stood up a, a group that is assessing it from the fleet perspective and also from the policy and medical perspective. And there's two principles that I've asked those teams to look at. One is whatever we do, it has to make perfectly good common sense to all of us as a Navy. So we know we operate in different environments from the Air Force and the Army and the Marines. So we have to address it from a, a Navy perspective. Mm -hmm. And the other one is we just we, we have to make sure that whatever we do, we're incentivizing better health. Mm -hmm. And you could argue that the way we administer it today, we uh, some of us starve ourselves to get there. Some of us dehydrate nice ourselves to get there. That's not incentivizing good health. So we're looking at ways to make sure that sailors are trying to get to a better place in their own personal health at the end of the day. Thanks for the question. Maybe next show we could do a live PT session for all hands. Sure. Yeah, that'd be <laughs> great. <an> idea. <laughs> all right, our next question is coming to us from Mayport, Florida. Mayport, go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Good afternoon, Master Chief. H1 Joshua Drew, independent duty corpsman on USS DeSullivan's DDG 68. I have a Manning question. Do you think it hinders or hurts sailors when they come from A school, C school, and they go to shore duty first? vice the fleet. From a healthcare provider view, I see uh, sailors, they come, they go to shore duty first, then they'll go to the fleet and they might not be able to handle the op tempo, the underways, the deployments, the operational uh, commitments. When they come from shore duty and maybe they have hours from 07 to 15 or 16 and now they come to the fleet and they need to be at work at 0630 and they're staying until 1830 later at night, do you think that hinders the sailor by sending them to shore duty first, vice the fleet? Well, H1, um, what I would like to share with you, first of all, I don't believe that there's any sailor that graduates from their A or C school that does not want to go to sea duty first. However, as you know, we have shore duty billets and we have sea duty billets and we have to man both. So as far as hindering, I don't think it does because I instill and hope that my leadership like yourself, make sure that those sailors are getting what they need while they're on shore duty, and you are also preparing them for their next duty station when they get to sea. So in a, in a perfect world, yes. everybody that came out of boot camp, A and C schools, would go right to the waterfront or to an operational unit at sea. But as Fleet referred to, we've got, we've got several billet or several ratings that are sea-centric and sea-intensive. They do go to sea. Mm -hmm. Then we have a lot of billets like the, and ratings like the ones that are in this audience today that are not sea-centric, they're shore-centric because of the nature of the work. So they naturally will go to those shore-duty billets. Uh, but there just isn't enough room as much as we've filled up the fleet over the last four or five years. Uh, there's not as much room out there to, to put sailors in every rate, in, in, in every class, right to sea. Mm -hmm. So we have to distribute them. But I think fleet's spot on. And it's really up to leadership to make sure they're ready when the time comes to go to sea. Definitely another good one. For our next question, let's go to a pre-recorded question from USS America. Hello, Master Chief. CS3 Weaver on board USS America. My question is, women have made a lot of strides in STEM, but they still fill a significantly smaller number of jobs than their male counterparts. What are we doing to recruit and retain women in these critical fields? Peter Officer Weaver, thank you so much for the question. And what I will share with you is I've had the wonderful opportunity over the last year or so to work with the Enlisted Women's and Submarine Task Force. So as you all know, in January, the NAV admin um, was released um, calling for applications for um, enlisted women in submarines. So I believe as an organization, we are looking to um, open up every rating and really give every sailor the opportunity to 
um, participate in any job that they want to, that they're qualified to participate in. And I believe in the future, we will continue on that road. Yeah, this is a really important topic for us. Uh, and it's a great question that you asked about the numbers of women in our Navy today. Uh, the total number for all, when you uh, put all of our officers and enlisted together is about 17.8% of our force is female. Not enough in my view, and we're trying to bring in more. We actually bring in between 23 and 25% women in the enlisted and the officer communities today. Uh, and that's a far better place than we were 10 years ago, but we're still trying to, to continue to attract the highest quality young women that are coming out of high school and colleges. And perfectly frank with you on the officer side, more than 50% of our, high, our college grads, uh, female grads, are STEM majors. And that's a, that's a fairly significant uh, change over the last 10 to 20 years. So we have to go after uh, young women in both our officer and enlisted communities if we're going to round out the Navy the way, w the way we want to. And then we have to retain that talent mm -hmm. as they march through a career after their first enlistment, after their MSR if you're an officer. And that's been a real challenge for us and there are issues that we're addressing uh, holistically in how we deal with the talent that we have in the Navy. Thanks for the question. Absolutely. Let's check back in with MC1 Blake and social media. MC1, what have you got for us? Thanks, MC1. So last week we asked sailors to submit questions for CMP uh, through Twitter at USN People or email uh, USNPeople at gmail.com. And we have received an overwhelming response. And so moving right along, our next question is for Fleet Master Chief, and it's from OSC Payne aboard USS America also. And I'm going to paraphrase, but this is a hairstyle question. And I know, Master Chief, you knew that there was going to be a hairstyle question coming up soon. But in the NEV admin for female hair regulations, the twists were authorized, but the dreadlocks were not. And Chief Payne was wondering why that is. Well, Chief Payne, thank you so much for the question. And first and foremost, I want to thank um, the um, feedback that we received from the fleet when we started down the um, road of updating our grooming standards for females. I got into the job in uh, March of 13, and that was one of the things that um, what I, was, I received with regards to we need to update our um, grooming standards. So we went out. East Coast, West Coast, around the globe, enlisted officers, and we asked their, for their feedback and what they wanted to see change. So as you know, with the new NAV admin that came out, we opened up the hairstyles that were going to be authorized. And I will share with you, Chief Payne, I personally um, took on the, um, the job of researching the dreadlocks. And I set in some um, beauticians that were experts in dreadlocks, and they talked to me about the maintenance and maintaining dreadlocks. And when we talk about deployments and having our shipmates out to sea for the length of time, I was concerned that they would not be able to maintain them. I shared that feedback um, again with the fleet. And um, with regards to, you said twist. If I have a twist hairstyle and it's not in regulation, I can fix it immediately. That's not the case with dreadlocks. That hair fuses together and the only way to fix that if it's not within the regulations would be to cut it. And we did not want to have our sailors have to deal with that. So that's why we came to the decision, twist yes, dreadlocks no, because of the maintenance. Thank you so much, Chief Payne, for the question. All right, I think it's safe to say you saw that one coming, or at least Ooh, somewhat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Master Chief. So let's head back out to sea with Carl Vinson. Carl Vinson, go ahead with your question. Sir, Master Chief, this is AO2 Bailey from the USS Carl Vinson. Uh, I just had a question concerning POV shipments. Has there been any changes with vehicle shipments overseas for PCS moves? Well, you know, uh, shipment, we'll take that back to uh, verify. Uh, to, but to my knowledge, no changes have been made for overseas shipment of POVs. Uh, there are a limited number of opportunities for those lift. It's a very expensive uh, proposition for the Navy to do. Uh, and there are, uh, we have seen some changes with respect to PCS changes to Hawaii, but not to other overseas locations. So we'll, we'll get an answer back out to your ship and make sure they know. Thank you. Wonderful. Let's head back out to Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk, go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, sir. Mass Chief, this is Pat Osterheim from HSC5. Sir, sailors take great pride and uh, respect in the history and heritage of their uniforms. My question is, what kind of changes can we anticipate for our current sea bags, and how is it going to affect our uniform allowances? You want to start? We never get a question about uniforms. Never. You want to start? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. All of these questions are great. So with regards to the sea bag, any future changes to the sea bag and the clothing allowance that we receive, if we have any changes. So right now, I will share with you, there, are no, um, there aren't any new 
um, initiatives for new uniforms to be added to the CBAC. As you know, however, we do have um, the um, service dress blue uniform for our males and females that's been updated and that will um, be phased in so it won't be like you have to go buy it and take money out of your pocket to replace that. That'll be a phased in approach. Um, the other uniform we're talking about for our E6 and below are the, um, the lightweight. Uh, lightweights yep. for the uh, lightweights MWUs. MWUs. We got some feedback from the fleet um, for those um, stairs that are serving in areas like um, Bahrain or over in um, um, Diego Garcia. So they asked us to look at a lightweight NWU. So that's being tested. We're almost complete with that test and that will be an optional item. Again, everybody won't be required to have it. So phased into your C bag and as you replace your uniform with your annual clothing allowance, that would be when you could buy that if you chose to. Yeah, the other Anything one else? that's out there that uh, we've gotten a lot of negative feedback on is the uh, fire resistant coveralls for those of you at sea, which are mandatory now. You must wear those. You can't wear the NWU ones when you go to sea. And uh, there's a lot of good reason, a lot of history behind why we went that path. Uh, but when we put those out, we didn't do a lot of research. We didn't do as much research and wear testing as we should have done. And they, they showed up uh, very stiff, very uh, heavy, weren't breathable, and they uh, discolored when they went through the laundry, lots of issues with it. So we've taken all that feedback uh, from uh, sailors like on the bush who spent nine months at sea with that uniform and others, and we've now redesigned that uniform, and we're in the process of going out on bids to, to produce a new FRV that, is, that answers a lot of those concerns. And that, that one's probably the biggest change, but it's really an update to a, an existing uniform, not a new one. All right, for our next question, let's go out to Everett Washington. Everett, go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, sir, Master Chief. I am Petty Officer Chase from Naval Station Everett. And my question is, as a Navy, we have taken great strides to bring awareness to topics such as suicide and um, sapper issues. I was wondering if there's any plans to implement um, postpartum depression awareness training um, at shore commands that have higher populations of pregnant sailors. Start? Yes, Go sir. Ahead. That's an um, outstanding question. And I'll be honest with you, that is the first time since we've been traveling um, CMP that I've heard that question. So I'm going to take that on board to see, because that makes sense. Um, and uh, we do need to look at the overall um, um, areas of where our sailors are having some challenges, and we can look into that type of training. Good question. All right, let's head back out to Mayport, Florida with a live question. Mayport, go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, sir. AC1 Osterberg coming from Naval Station Mayport, Florida. My question is, with everything going on in the world today, uh, can sailors expect to start seeing uh, individual augmentee billets start popping up again? Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. We get asked that a lot. And uh, it, obviously, there's concern because of the pain that we uh, all experienced uh, back in the mid-2000s when uh, our IA counts were approaching 11, 12,000 IAs. And that had a big impact on both at-sea commands but also shore commands. Well, that number's all the way down below 2,500 today. And we expect it to bottom out about 2,000. And at, at 2,000 IAs, we're probably uh, gonna see the reserve force carry most of that burden. And they, frankly, the reserve force has been carrying the burden for, uh, for the active force on IAs for a very long time. Uh, but that number I don't see going up significantly uh, because we're not in large masses uh, inside Iraq and Afghanistan. And most of, the, most of the deployments over there will be handled by the services and not through an IA process that we experienced uh, five, 10 years ago. So uh, I don't think you have to look forward to another tax on our commands with more IAs in the future. Thanks for the question. Indeed. Good question. Next question, come up from our studio audience. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, uh, sir and Master Chief. Thank you for uh, taking my question. Uh, my question today is, why does the T uh, Navy not have a TA waiver if you go over the 16 credit hours per fiscal year, sir? Well, I'm going to let uh, Fleet Bello, who is on TA right now getting her degree, answer that because she gets this question a lot. Thanks. It is a good question. So what I um, hear you say is I, I, I'm ready to move on to more than 16 um, credits. And I'll share with you, we are, we are committed to making sure that we give all of our sailors, again, that are eligible for TA to have the opportunity to use that. So when you talk, that's pretty, 16 credits a year is pretty good when regards to taking classes and also doing your work and also needing to study for advancement and also needing to get qualification. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> so, 
I'm just joking. So uh, bottom line, we want everybody to have the same opportunity. And if somebody's using 18, 23, and 24, that means somebody else is not getting an opportunity to use TA. So that's why we have the cap on that. And it's for a year. So that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good load that you um, are um, handling while you're also doing your Navy job. Oh yeah. Thank you, man. You're so, welcome. So we also want we also want if you're going after TA and you're doing those 16 credit hours, we want it 100 percent funded. Right. And and it's in the budget. TA's 100 percent funded for the Navy for as far in the future as we can see. So if you're if you're if you like TA and you want to continue to do it at a cap at 16 credit mm -hmm. hours a year, you're going to get funded 100 percent. Right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Sir. Good Wonderful question. question. Well, if Good I may question. just kind of follow up. Obviously, education is important. We know we get advancement credits for you know bachelor's or associate's degrees. Have you ever considered doing it for graduate level programs? Uh, we get that question quite a bit, mm -hmm. but there are other opportunities for graduate education. That's principally what the GI Bill was designed to do for many of us. Uh, and so I think the GI Bill is kind of the answer for anybody who wants to go beyond TA, pa past a, the first degree into a graduate level degree. So. Um, no, there's no, there's no uh, process in place now to open up grad ed to, or graduate degrees inside of TA at this point. All right. Thank question. you, sir. For our next question, let's check in with MC1 Blake. MC1, what do you have for us? Hey, thanks, MC1. We've had some really great questions so far. If you have a question for CNP or uh, Fleet Master Chief, it is not too late. You can still reach us at Twitter uh, or at USN People via Twitter. So our next question is from YN3 Mercedes Payne uh, on board USS Baton. And she says, sir, can you tell me about the military compensation report that is coming out this month? What changes in our benefits do you see from this report? Yeah, first of all, I want you to know that I'm wearing my baton uh, belt buckle from when I was down there on your change of command right after you guys got back from deployment in the fall. So uh, for all baton there sailors out there, uh, <laughs> welcome home. Uh, you guys had an incredible deployment, and batans had a lot of long deployments over the last 10 years, and you guys did, did your, ship, uh, your ship name proud. Uh, so uh, we, we, like you, just saw the report. It was released a few days ago. Uh, and we are digging through the 250 pages of data, uh, all the recommendations, and, and looking for things that make sense to us and where we have to provide comment. Uh, the Department of Defense owes the White House uh, our view on what the, the commission said uh, by the middle of March. So we have just a, about a month to really analyze 250 pages worth of data to, to determine what we want to support and how we want to support it or not. Uh, and, I, and so we're going to continue to look at that. We will, we will certainly communicate with the fleet as we look. But keep in mind, these are, these are recommendations from a commission. These are not things we're going to implement into law or policy anytime in the near future. Uh, and, and I think the other, the other issue we hear a lot from sailors is, is this going to change my current benefits? And the answer is absolutely no. Uh, one of the premises that went into the commission's report and all their work was, that it will do no harm to sailors who exist on active duty today. In other words, anything that, that we have in place today will be grandfathered in, uh, back in. So in other words, if your retirement system, if the retirement system were to change under this commission recommendation years down the road, you would be able to keep the one you're on and have an opportunity to opt into the new one if you thought it was better. Uh, though, so I wouldn't worry too much about the commission report. Uh, we, it's going to take us a while to analyze what it says and, and what it means, uh, and we will communicate that to you as we learn going forward. So great question. I know it's on, a lot, on the minds of a lot of sailors out there uh, because you read the headlines like people are going to get rid of your retirement program or your health care. That is absolutely not true. Okay? Thanks for asking the question. Definitely alleviating concerns there. Let's check back in with Carl Vinson. Carl Vinson, go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Master Chief. My name is Seaman Stratford from Deck Department, Fish and the Board, USS Carlin. Sir, my question is, do you think our current tax sailor program is effective in getting sailors into rate in a timely manner? And also, do you see at some point in time the tax sailor program being done away with to allow all sailors to come into the Navy as rated sailors? Sir. That's a great question, yes. sir, so I'm Go going ahead. to answer it, <laughs> if I can. Julian Shipmate, thanks a lot. And the reason why I started smiling when you were asking the question is because, as again, 
These are questions on the minds of all your shipmates out in the fleet. So this is not the first time we've heard that. And one of our responsibilities is to make sure that as we balance all the ratings, we are looking to make sure that we're giving opportunities like yourself, a pack sailor who came in and it can advance at that 24 months um, time frame and be ready to take an advancement, an advancement exam to third class petty officer. So we are looking at it. We are um, evaluating the um, program. And I heard you ask if we think it's going to be around for a while. And the question is, jury's still out. Um, CMP has asked us to get together to make sure that we are providing every opportunity possible for our shipmates. So we don't want to hold you back if it's time for you to advance. So know that we do understand your frustration, and we are um, in, the, in the process of finding out ways that we can give you that opportunity to advance when you're ready to advance. So that's an outstanding question. Thank yeah, you. Let, let me add on that um, there are a lot of great NCs, career counselors out there in the Navy who are trying to get you placed in the, mm -hmm. into the rates you want to be placed into. But I would, I would ask you, don't hold out for that perfect rate and that perfect uh, match for you. Uh, because oftentimes what that means is you wait too long and you get boxed into having no choice at the end of the day. So uh, make sure you keep your aperture open, look at different options, and uh, take the one that best matches you in the time frame that allows you to take a test and get a stripe and move on. Mm -hmm. So that's really important. Listen to your career counselors, listen to your chief and your chain of command. Thank you. Great advice. Let's head out to USS Arleigh Burke for our next question. I'm CS3 Harris, Isaiah Harris from the Arleigh Burke. And uh, my question for you today is, what are the chances of deployments getting shorter? Ah, well, welcome home, first of all, <laughs> CS3. I know you guys just got back this fall as well, part of this, uh, the Bush Strike Group. Uh, I, hey, we are on a path right now, uh, and CNO is committed to this. Fleet leadership is committed to this to re gradually reduce the lengths of our deployments around the globe. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why we've had these extended deployments over the last several years, uh, but we are committed now to start drawing that back down to about seven month deployments. And we think by in the next couple of years, somewhere in the fiscal year 17 timeframe, all of our CSGs and ESGs will be down to that seven month deployment. So we're gradually getting there. It's going to take a little time to work through the backlog and maintenance, which drives a lot of these dates. Uh, but we're uh, slowly but surely working our way back. Thanks for the question. I think you might have made some smiling sailors right there, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Let's head out to Naval Station Everett. Everett, go ahead with your question. Morning, Master Chief. My name is Oz Tuhala from Naval Station Everett. And my question for you is, do you feel that changing traditions like CPO 365 and crossing the line are best for the Navy's future? Um, what I will share with you, shipmate, is tradition and heritage, I believe it's going to stay around for a long time. But I do understand that there are some things that we did back in the day that did not really effectively make us a better sailor, a better chief, or as we cross the line, a, a different person. So I think it's important that we continue to make sure that we ask ourselves the question, what value is added? as we continue to go through training on heritage and tradition. So I believe it is best for our future when we ask that question. Thank you. All right, let's go back to Norfolk, Virginia with a live feed. Norfolk, go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, sir. This is Petty Officer Brown. My question is concerning advancement. The current calculation of advancement has changed twice in four years. Will there be some type of standardization to look forward to in the future? Yeah, there, there have been some changes, and we think they're pretty important changes. Uh, and all these changes and the recommendations for them came from the chief's mess, up through MCPON and then to me. Uh, and I liked the, uh, the, the direction that MCPON wants to take, the uh, final multiple score calculation for advancement opportunities. And it principally that the more senior you get, the more we should value your performance and less value on the test taking. Uh, the more junior you are, then we have to make sure that you meet a minimum standard of knowledge uh, and skills so that the test is, is weighted about where it was before. Uh, we're slowly getting rid of uh, P&A points uh, and only all allocating P&A points to the top 25% 20, of the sailors who are, are in, uh, in zone four being advanced. So if you, perf if you continue to perform real well and you continue to test well enough, uh, you're going to like your chances, and it doesn't disadvantage junior sailors over those who have been in uh, their rate, in their pay grade for longer periods of time. It puts everybody on an equal footing and competes. And I think that's what we heard from sailors, that's what we heard from the Chiefs mess, and that's the direction we're going to go. 
We've, we've decided not to make any changes over the next couple years so we can see how the past changes are affecting mm -hmm. the types of folks that are getting advanced and the feedback that we get from the chief's mess and from commands uh, is going to help us determine if we need to continue to move in that direction or did we go too far and can we reverse some of those decisions. So that's what we're doing and uh, if you've got some ideas about how you would like to see that change, please get it up through the chief's mess because we will listen to them. Thank you. And CMP, just yep. to make, to clarify something about the PNA point. So those of us who already are using the PNA point, you had two tests to um, continue to use in that test. We said we we're going to go five cycles prior to you not being able to use them. So for those of you that are looking at me like, what? <laughs> Three more chances to get advanced using those PNA points, and then we start only allowing the top 25% to receive the. Um, PNA points. Yeah, and while we're talking about advancements, uh, the last two, three cycles, we've had advancement opportunity for most ratings in the Navy to be above our 10 year average. Our projections for this coming March exam cycle is the same. So we're going to continue to see good advancement opportunity for most rates, and we fully recognize that there are rates out there where we are at or near zero opportunity, and we're trying to balance those over time. We also recognize that there are rates where it's 100% opportunity. I don't think that's any healthier than zero. We, we need to be balanced. We need to be roughly in that 40 to 50% opportunity range for as many sailors as possible. And, and there, are, there are reasons for that. The CB ratings are at or near zero because we've, we've reduced the size of that force over the last few years, but even those rates are starting to stabilize and we'll see improvement there. And there are other ratings like that. So keep your, uh, keep your hopes up and I think we're gonna do our job to try to balance rating and opportunity for advancement for as many rates as possible. Okay, let's take another question from our studio audience. Petty Officer Stafford, go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Master Chief Petty Officer Stafford from NAC, Maryland. With the fleet transitioning from the P3s to the P8s, I was wondering how you think that's going to affect the CT community since we primarily augment these squadrons. And do you see any changes in the training pipeline to include the training for TFO and not just aircrew? Yeah, well, you're, you're striking at my heart here, Pete <laughs> Stafford, uh, former P3 guy. Uh, and, and so the long transition plan out of the EP3, which is what you're referring to, and some other capability you're familiar with, is a plan to, uh, to spread that capability between not only P8, but also with the Triton program. So that, that master plan is in work, it's funded, uh, the teams are working through how we're gonna man it, how we're gonna equip it, and then of course, how we're gonna operate it, which is gonna change from the good old days in the EP3, which is a great platform. Uh, but we are making those transitions, and I think in the, in the end, we're gonna have more data, more information available to do the work that you do and I think the CT rate and the folks that have been uh, part of that, that community for years will find themselves very well employed over time. Thanks. Thank you, sir. All right, for our next question, let's go to a pre-recorded one from USS George H.W. Bush. Hi, I'm M.C. Woodruff from Engineering Department on board the USS George H.W. Bush. My question is, will the early out option become more available to other rates? Will the early out, uh, option be more available to more, to more rates? More rates. Yeah. And um, what I will share with you, Shipmate, is again, one of our responsibilities is to make sure that we keep our rates balanced. And um, what we found that the right balance rate is between 98 and 102 percent, and we're good. So unless a rate becomes extreme and over that a lot of percentages, we probably will not be offering the early out program. But we do look at that constantly and make sure that we're keeping everybody balanced and that goes to advancement to CMP. That's why we make sure with Seaways, we're paying attention to make sure that we don't put any of the ratings, get any of the ratings either underman or overman. So um, the jury's still out on that. Okay, for our next question, we're going out to USS Iwo Jima that is also underway. Iwo Jima, go ahead with your question. Yes. Uh a1 logs from the Aircraft Intermediate Maintenance Department here on board USSC, which is the billet base with loop detailing. Well, I, th I we, you broke up in the middle of the question, but I think you were asking about BBD or billet based detailing, what that's going to do to help. Uh, and, and frankly, uh, uh, we're going to go live with billet based detailing in August of this year, August, September of this year. And that's gonna really expand our, our insights into the specific requirements for every billet in the enlisted force in the Navy. 
much like we do with the officer communities today. We know exactly what training is required for every uh, officer billet in the Navy. We know exactly what rank, uh, what education, and, uh, and what skill sets and experience you bring to be able to qualify for those billets. We do not have that level of detail in the enlisted billet cycle today. That's what BBD will do for us, which means when you jump on a CMS ID and shop for your next job, you're gonna be, have a lot more awareness and knowledge about what that next job uh, requires and whether you will qualify much earlier so we don't hang on and you don't have hope out there uh, without full knowledge of what the billet requirements are. So we're really looking forward to BBD getting out there. It'll give insight, much greater insight to your career counselors and your chain of command to understand what billets they have on board the ship, how they're described and what the requirements are for each one. And CMP, what I'd also add um, to that is one of the um, um, areas that we're looking at now and talking to commands about is from their a um, AMD, excuse me, and EDVR is to making to make sure that they post exactly what they want in a sailor. So whatever billet they have, this sailor, this pay grade with these NECs with this type of experience and training. That will also be a part of um, BBD. So therefore, the commands will be getting the right fit when they um, gain that sailor on board. It'll, it'll also ha allow us in the detailers when we're cutting your orders to know what training you need to qualify for that billet. Now let's say you're going to a billet where you've, you've got an NEC but you don't have the latest version or an update or a new NEC that, that takes your experience and makes you a better trained sailor to fit into the billet you're going to. So we will make sure that we get the training for you in route as opposed to showing up on the ship or into the squadron uh, without the NEC and then they go, well, I guess I got to send you off ship uh, and then it's time out of, the, out of the fleet where you're not getting that experience. It doesn't help the sailor, it doesn't help the ship, it really is on us and the Bupers to make sure we get that done. Okay, for our next question, let's go out to sunny San Diego via Skype. San Diego, go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, sir and Master Chief. My question is, um, as a PS, I've seen the service records go away, the field service records go away, and we've implemented the, in, the electronic service record. Is there a plan to integrate our ESR that we're required to update and keep up to date um, with the other systems to take the burden off of the sailors and ensuring the accuracy of their service records, especially those eligible for board selections? I think that means I'm going to answer this question because the <laughs> boss didn't say anything. But no, outstanding. It's electronic. I don't understand it. Outstanding question, PS3. Um, we are in the process right now of updating a lot of our IT um, systems and those particular, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the applications. Applications that, yeah, that you're talking about, yeah. like for um, BOL and you have NSIPs and you have ESR. So we have a bunch of different programs that we ask sailors to go and they have to stop, get out, start all over again. So to answer your question, yes, in the future there is a um, initiative for us to be able to one stop shop, push a button, and everything gets populated. And I think that's what you're talking about. Vice having to um, go and to update three or four different systems out there. So yes, absolutely, going to take some time. So um, be patient, yeah. please, <laughs> please. We're still in the 1950s when it comes to IT. We got a ways to go yet, uh, but there is a there is a very deliberate planning effort underway right now to modernize the Navy's. Uh, personnel IT infrastructure, but it does take time. You can imagine the number of applications we have out there running simultaneously. The uh, people in this room are all used to networks and things that go on in networks. You can only imagine where ours is today in personnel. We, we've got to invest in this and we're, on, we're setting a course to get there. But your, your ideas like that one about ESR updates uh, are really important. So feed those ideas up so that we know we're covering everything we need to cover. Great. Let's take another live question from Mayport, Florida. Mayport, go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, sir. FC1 Hendricks from USS Roosevelt, DDG-80. My question for you is, what are some policies and tools that may be implemented in a new personnel program to ensure our top performing sailors are being retained? Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful question, and I love that background uh, view of Mayport down there in the harbor. Uh, <laughs> I wish I were there right now. It's a beautiful place. Uh, we're doing a lot right now to, uh, to assess how we can attract, continue to attract great sailors to come into the Navy, but more importantly is to retain the best ones for a long career, uh, up to 20 years and beyond. 
Uh, and uh, my, my concern is that I don't think be, because of our, the, the data, the amount of data that we have that is not well understood, that we often make mistakes uh, in the personnel business on trying to uh, make sure that we give the right opportunity to the best sailor at the right time. And then are we putting in place mechanisms to train and have a continuum of training for the enlisted force in particular, which we haven't had. We do pretty well in the officer, for, in the officer communities. So we're looking at that all together at one time uh, to look at policies that we could uh, implement that help retain more talent in, um, in multiple aspects of the Navy to include our female population, uh, to re retain our best technical populations. And, and those are folks that are very expensive to train, very expensive to keep. Uh, we don't want to lose that great talent if we can, if we can set policies in place that uh, inspire you to stay for a longer period of time. So more to follow. We've got a lot of initiatives underway right now. We're sorting through those. We're trying to figure out which ones we can implement in the next year or two and those that will take longer because uh, they just take longer. And, uh, and there, there are a lot of good initiatives that are being thought of by our, the folks that run Bupers right now, and I think uh, you'll like what you see when we get to them. Thank you. All right, let's take another question from our studio audience. Go ahead. Good afternoon, sir, yeah. Master Chief. Seaman Seville, Ceremonial Guard. My question for you is, what is something that you have in your toolbox of success that you would advise every sailor to have? Well, those are always the hard questions. You want to start with that one? Um, I will start, yes, sir. One of the things that I think that's in my toolbox is I'm going to share patience. Patience, and, and we've heard that a lot with regards to um, advancement and being able to stay in a rate um, when we're told that we might need to convert. But I would share with you being patient and just allowing your leadership to guide you and mentor you and counsel you and, and not wanting it right now. You know, we're, we're in this now Navy, now Navy, you know, microwave, I want it now. Be patient, be patient, and I guarantee you, continue to doing those great things, be patient, and everything that your heart desires will come to you. You just got to be patient. Now, coming from somebody who just goes crazy after two seconds of waiting on something, <laughs> but I've learned patience over the last 30 years. I Everyone? would add, uh, you know, there's lots of things that you can read about uh, the great leaders uh, and great success stories have had. In our business, I believe that you have to be humble. And you have to t put sailors and, and your subordinates ahead of yourself every single time. And if you do that, you're going to be successful because they will raise you up. Uh, I think you'll, you'll feel that the longer you stay in the Navy. I think it's evident by every great leader I've come across, the people that I try to emulate are those who have always, are always putting their sailors and their, and, their, and, their, and their juniors ahead of themselves when the opportunity exists. And there'll be plenty of opportunity for that. Great question. Thank you. Excellent question. All right, let's check back in with MC1 Blake in social media. MC1, what do you have for us? Hey, thanks, MC1. We just received a bunch of brand new questions from sailors across the fleet. And this next one is from Twitter, uh, at USN People. Are the SRB levels going to change to give educated sailors in technical rates an incentive to stay in? Yeah, SRBs, we look at SRBs uh, a couple times a year. And we adjust them based on a retention behavior by every rate that we have. So if a rate starts to look like we're losing sailors that we would rather keep because that rate's so important to our Navy mission, uh, you'll start to see SRBs roll in and opportunity to, uh, to apply for those SRBs. On the other hand, there are rates that we're starting to see retention behavior be so good that there's no longer a reason to continue to in incentivize people to stay in those rates, so we'll start trimming those back. So it's an ebb and flow, it comes and goes, much like advancement opportunities, are influenced by that same process. Uh, SRBs are looked at a couple times a year so that we can, uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the year, we've got the right skill sets and the right numbers of folks in every rate that we have in the Navy. All right, for our next question, let's check back in with USS Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima, go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, sir. Wyan 2 Feynman with TACRON 2-2. Uh, sir, the fiscal year 15 posture state to the Armed Service Committee support for pay and benefits. Do you have any insight as to if this would affect education programs such as A or NC pay? Yeah, the, uh, first of all, I'm impressed that you're reading the posture statement for uh, fiscal year 15, uh, but good on you, and uh, I, I'm glad you're paying attention to the, uh, the challenges and the tough choices that we're all having to make uh, 
in a declining budget environment. That said, we're, we're not cutting back on those educational opportunities. I mentioned earlier, if you, if you weren't able to be up uh, when the earlier question on tuition assistance came up, we're funding tuition assistance at 100 percent. We're not taking any, uh, we're not ta taking any, ta we're not applying a tax to that program at all to pay for other things. So uh, uh, we're, we're fully committed uh, to the best that we can to continue to uh, provide opportunities for sailors at every, pay, at every level uh, to be able to improve their, their professional and personal lives. And education is absolutely essential part of that. All right, Admiral, we're going back to where you said you'd rather be. Mayport, Florida, we're coming to us go. live. Mayport, <laughs> go ahead with your question. Hello, I'm BM2 Moore. I'm from the USS Kearney, DDG-64. And my question is concerning the ship spaces and equipment I've noticed our degrading because of the outsources of jobs to contractors. Why aren't we training our own sailors to do the job to take more responsibility of their space and their equipment? Wow, uh, that, that's a really good question. And it's, it's one of those uh, balance equations, frankly, that uh, you know, we, we have sailors that are brought into the Navy for very specific reasons. Fewer and fewer pack sailors that are generalists in, in, in particular. So the work that we were bringing you in to do is work we need you to do, as opposed to uh, some of the base upkeep and, and, uh, and building upkeep that you're referring to. Uh, so we have contracted that out, and, and if those contractors aren't doing their job, then we, we need to make sure that they understand uh, their requirement and their loyalty to the Navy is as important as those who wear a uniform. And those base commanders should be made aware of areas where you're not happy. Uh, or you see an opportunity to improve that, uh, let's get that word up through the chain of command and make sure everybody's aware of it. Okay, let's take another pre-recorded question. This one coming to us from USS Fort McHenry. Good morning, sir. I'm OS2 Rodney Daniels on board USS Fort McHenry. A lot of my shipmates were wondering if there's going to be a special incentive pay for people who do back-to-back -back deployments in one year. Go ahead. Back-to-back -back deployment in one year. I want to be that person. Wow. Well, first of all, I seen you out there, and I wish I was where you are. That, that was a wonderful um, picture, and you had something in the background. I'm not going to call it a carrier, but I think that's what it was. But um, with regards to incentive pay for back-to-back -back sea duty, um, excuse me, deployments, I don't know if you were able to listen to um, CNP earlier, but we talked about um, the initiative that's already um, being worked with regards to those type of deployments. Um, getting down to seventh month deployment. And I know you've um, heard about optimized um, fleet readiness program. We're working that. So I think for you, OS2, the, the days of you seeing a, a seven or eight month deployment, coming home for four months, and then going back for, out for seven, eight months, I, I think that we are committed to that not, for that not to happen. So if that doesn't happen, then guess what's going to be with the pay? CMP? Yeah. So. Um, I, I think what OS2 might be referring to as well, though, is that we do have sailors that go from sea to sea, yeah. and they might find themselves coming off a platform that just got off a of deployment onto a platform that's going on deployment. And whether that was Fort McHenry or somebody else, we understand that. Uh, and and it's, uh, uh, there, there are ways that we can incentivize sailors uh, to do those sorts of things, but we would prefer not to ask you to do that. Uh, for obvious reasons. There are other sailors I've run into who love going to sea and want to go on deployment and so they, they, they uh, volunteer for uh, those sorts of jobs where they can go from one platform to another and go to, on deployment. Uh, so it depends, uh, but there is no pay incentive today that accounts for what you described. That said, I will tell you that the four deployed naval forces in both PAC fleet and in ROTA are asking, hey, we're out there a lot more than the average ship uh, do, doing deployments. W where are we in this uh, high deployment allowance that's, uh, been, that's been allocated to folks that have deployed for greater than 220 days? And the answer is, you got to deploy for greater than 220 days right now or you're not eligible for that, for that pay. Uh, and, but we are aware that uh, there are folks that, uh, in FDNF that, frankly, are out there quite a bit when you, when you total it up on an annual basis. Uh, but you also get to come back home periodically and not be deployed. So it's a balance that we have to address, uh, and we can only afford so much. Right now, we're, we're, willing to, we're willing to compensate those sailors who have gone on deployment and then extended well beyond 
um, a normal six-month appointment into 220 days and beyond, which happened to Bush. It happened to her entire strike group. It happened to Bataan and the ships associated with Bataan. And it's happened to uh, a few other units out there. And those folks have been compensated for those longer deployments. All right, let's take another question from Skype. This one from Naval Base San Diego. San Diego, go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, sir. Master Chief MC1 Chang from ComNav Surf Pack. And my question is, what type of impact do you see the current CG modernization plan having on fleet readiness? That's a CMP question. Okay, I'll take that one on. Uh, yeah, as you know, we're, we, uh, there's a plan underway. Your, your current boss was the architect of that plan, so you might want to ask him. Uh, he's, he's been the guy who's really pushed this, uh, this, uh, this idea as an innovative way to continue to keep important assets in our fleet that we need into the future. Those cruisers uh, play an important role in, in our CSGs, and uh, so, but we also recognize that we've got to modernize them, we've got to update them, we've got to keep them well maintained. And, and to do that, you've got to bring them through these rather extensive maintenance periods. And, and if you're going to put them through extensive maintenance periods, you could argue that you don't need to keep them manned fully during all of that time. So, um, so Admiral Roden and, and Admiral Fanta now in the Pentagon have uh, designed a plan. It's been uh, put in the budget. And uh, I think in, at the end of the day, it's going to vastly, uh, it's at least going to sustain, if not improve, our overall fleet readiness because the capability that they provide to our strike groups is not going to go away because we decommission those ships. They're going to stay on active duty for a long time into the future. All right, let's take another live question from Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk, go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, sir. It's Airman State from HC5. I was wondering if what are these? If, if there's any statistics on the effectiveness on NKOs and GMTs? Uh, boy, uh, NKO. Uh, my um, so my informal poll of a raise of hands of how effective NKO is almost always turns out to be it's really really bad. Uh, so we know we've got a lot of work to do on NKO. Uh, uh, and the effectiveness of NKO with respect to GMT, therefore, is not going to be very good. If the environment's not good and the, and the media that, it, that delivers that GMT is not very good, you're not going to have a good experience and the effect is not going to be very good. Uh, but do we have metrics to test to see how, how uh, well that GMT is being received either through NKO or otherwise? Um, no, we don't have that. Uh, now I'd like to have that ability. But the general feedback I get from sailors, if I were to ask you, I'm sure you would probably tell me that you don't think it's very effective in many cases. So what we are trying to do is consolidate uh, the numbers of uh, GMT requirements into, into smaller numbers, uh, obviously, and to, and to effectively use our core values training uh, to teach the fundamentals of GMT, whatever the topic is. And when you do that, you find out that you thematically hit things over and over again, and it starts to sink in, as opposed to uh, one topic at a time at different periods in time. Uh, it's not as effective. So uh, we're doing a lot of work. Admiral White down in NETSI is taking this, this bear on. Uh, we owe it to our fleet, our fleet COs to try to reduce the amount of time that they have to spend training their crews and, and not be reliant on a system that doesn't seem to be as robust as it, it, it certainly needs to be, and that's an NKO. All right, thank you, sir. Let's go back underway with USS Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima, go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, sir. HM2 Claypool, Fleet Surgical Team 8. Uh, in regards to the 1% VA action, what is the proposal accounting for the differences in VA areas where the cost of living is higher versus the lower areas? Yeah, so BAH rates are, are uh, assessed uh, by region and by community uh, several times during uh, the course of uh, a fit-up cycle. So they're adjusted based on what the, the rental market and the market uh, indicators are, and that's done by a different, different agency outside of the Navy control. Um, and, and so those rates are done uh, by an independent source, and, and, we, and, and they are supposed to adjust for the cost of living, uh, the rental market, and, and all of those things that factor in. The 1% reduction that you're reading about is, is just that. It's a 1% reduction from 100% of BAH. Uh, when I was a young guy in the Navy, we were at 75%. 
uh, and we thought that was pretty good. We've gotten used to 100%, which is very good. Uh, and all we're doing now is, is trying to arrest the growth of BAH, which uh, we all know that in some communities, in many communities, especially where you've got a large fleet population, that uh, landlords tend to, look at, uh, tend to look at those BAH rates, and that's what they're going to charge because they know they can get that. Uh, so we've got to be careful about not just growing BAH uh, because we can. We've got we've to put some controls in there. And the, the start of that is just is this initial step of, of 1%, and we hope we don't have to go any further than that just to keep the, the inflation of rental markets to a level we can afford in the future. Absolutely. Well, we've got some great questions so far, and the show is sadly coming to an end, but we're going to take another one from our studio audience. Go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Master Chief. Seaman Knight, Ceremonial Guard. I read recently that uh, the fleet or uh, Fleet Marine Force corpsmen might be going away and being replaced with uh, enlisted Marines. What opportunities or options might individuals who are already in that rate or hope to be in that rate in the next few years have, sir? I'm not that aware of that. That is the first one. I've heard. First that time also. I've heard that. Where'd you read that, shipmate? Uh, it was on uh, military.com, I believe. Okay. We're we'll going to look at it, and I know where you live, so we'll get you an answer. <laughs> Thank, thanks for the question. Thanks, sir. But to my knowledge, we're being asked to provide more corpsmen to the Marine Corps, not less. Thank you, sir. You bet. All right, we definitely we've got some time to take another social media question. MC1, do you have one for us? Absolutely, MC1. This next one is from Petty Officer Taylor Farish, who sent one to USM People at Gmail, and he asks, did we lose cap quotas when the new cap instruction went into effect? Outstanding question, and everybody pay attention. <laughs> Absolutely not. All we did was change it from two times a year to once a year between 1 July and 30 September this year, so this fiscal year. But no command lost any quotas. Um, CNP was very um, specific in making sure when he gave us direction that we didn't take any cap quotas from any of those commands that are eligible to receive caps. So one more time, because I know I stuttered the first time. Absolutely not, shipmate. <laughs> All right, Admiral, we've got about 90 seconds left. Do you have anything we missed? Uh, we covered a lot of ground and uh, really appreciate the questions. And I'm sure there's several more out there that are unanswered. And if we get a hold of those questions, we will respond to you. So uh, just because we didn't get to them uh, doesn't mean we won't answer them. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a website out there, an email address called usnpeople at gmail.com where you can get uh, subscribed to our weekly update that comes out um, every week that we send out to the fleet. Uh, but we'll all, you can also send your question to that email address and we'll respond to you on that email. So feel free to, to get in touch with us that way. Hey, I, I would just say that uh, there's a lot of churn out there uh, in the media today about this military compensation report that's out and, and I would, uh, I would only ask you to all breathe through your noses, don't hyperventilate over this as if the world's going to change in, in your pocketbook tomorrow. It's not going to happen. Uh, these are recommendations, these are things that we're going to take on. Leave it to the folks in Washington, like guys like me and Fleet Master Chief Beldo. Uh, we've got your interests at heart and we'll represent you to make sure that uh, no, no harm is done to your quality of service. Uh, in this Navy because you, you can see by the number of folks that are out there dialing in from Iwo Jima and Vincent out in Fifth Fleet uh, and sailors that are on both coasts uh, doing great work for us all over this world. All right, uh, Admiral. Unfortunately, we we're thank out of you. time. I apologize, everyone. Thank okay. you for our studio audience. Thank you, Admiral. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>